Hey YouTube, this is Jim Neve from Jim Neve Woodworks. Um, today I'm going to go back in time to when I started working with uh, my CNC machine to kind of do a CNC basics or CNC 101 coverage of just what is a CNC machine, uh, what are some of the variations, what are the parts of it physically and software wise. Um, when I started out, I didn't have, I didn't know any of this stuff, and I didn't find any consolidated place on a video or on the internet that kind of explained all the pieces at a high level first, just to kind of get me going. So that's what I'm going to try to do today. Um, I'm standing here next to my Avid CNC machine, which is currently running a laser job right now, and uh, printing out my logo. But there's a lot of different kinds of CNC machines. A uh, huge variety in physical size, cost, uh, capabilities, and uh, this is just you know one of the machines I have. So I'm going to go over some of those differences, and again, just try to give uh, people uh, who don't have much familiarity kind of a starting point, um, so they can start you know beginning. Hopefully, what I did is a kind of a journey through this, and, and to start to do some cool stuff in the you know either as a hobby or, or for work. Um, so, for those of you that are experienced with CNC machines, uh, you know, know quite a bit about it, or even a moderate amount about it, this is probably going to be kind of boring for you. This is really meant for those people who are just starting out and really want to get some high-level, uh, 10,000 foot kind of basics to get them going. So, hopefully, hopefully you enjoy it. Okay, the term CNC stands for computer numerical control. And all that really means is that uh, you've got uh, computer hardware and software controlling a machine. Um, kind of the more strict definition, if you're looking like what Wikipedia is, um, they're really talking about a tool that's controlled by a machine. So, you know, if you look at machining uh, back before CNC, you know, you had mills and lathes and things that uh, operators operated by cranking wheels and stuff and you know physically moving the tool whether it was you know some kind of a cutter um, or a mill head with a rotating color a cutter uh, by manual controls and so CNC is really just referring to the computerization of the control of that so you replace the cranks with the motor and then you have a computer program to drive those motors and it essentially automates the whole operation. You can control many axes in a very precise and repeatable fashion. Um, and so it just speeds up things immensely. Um, but I like to look at it a little looser than that. It's not just tools. I mean, um, you know, print heads, lasers, uh, knives, all of those things are really the same thing. It's really some sort of a tool. You can think about this pen as a tool and if I automate it with the motor, I make it a CNC machine. So uh, I'll show you uh, some of the CNC machines I have around my house that you might not think are CNC machines, but in, in reality, in the broad sense, they are. This is a small laser CNC machine. Um, you can get them on Amazon for a couple hundred bucks. You can see here we have a laser head on a small gantry. This machine can only move in Y and X direction. So it's got two axes of movement and then a small four watt laser. It's completely controlled by a small Arduino board in the back here. Um, the drivers and Arduino and everything are all on this because the motors here are so small, there's tiny little stepper motors. Um, this little board can drive the motors easily by itself. The whole thing is powered by a simple small power supply and the USB cable here plugs into a laptop or computer and you run um, a, a program, it's kind of an open source program called Laser Gerbil, uh, which um, has both interactive controls as well as does some conversion of like pictures to a format that's readable. So you could do content uh, creation a little bit in there but it's mostly um, creating uh, g-code files to run on this and uh, doing controls for like um, calibrating the machine and stuff but it's a very simple little um, machine uh, here 
This is my wife's Cricut machine. Um, this is also a CNC. Um, this has, it's similar to a printer. The paper is moved in and out by the rollers on this. And then the head here can have either a cutter mounted in here. Uh, that's, this is the cutter side. It's basically like a little drag knife. Um, or a pencil, pen, or other kind of marker here. So this machine can do essentially cutting operations and drawing um, operations in it. So this machine is a three-axis machine with two different kinds of essentially machining operations, one for drawing or marking and one for cutting um, on this device. And it again has um, internal controllers and then it's um, remotely the content is downloaded and uh, configured through USB to an application that runs on a laptop. So here's one of the most uh, popular CNC machines in the world. Uh, many people would argue this isn't a CNC machine because it's not strictly machining, but um, there's a lot of things considered CNC that aren't strictly machining. And my argument would be that it's really the same thing as a CNC. Um, if you open this up, you have two different mechanical axes. You've got a head here that moves back and forth. That's the print head. And then, again, rollers move the sheets back and forth in the Y direction. And then there's a the print head here is uh, essentially the business end of the machine where a machining or spindle or laser or other thing might be. This is shooting um, or spraying ink droplets on in the, in the right position to create um, the uh, printed object or the content, which is in this case a text uh, or a sheet of text or a sheet with pictures on it um, and graphics. So this is uh, got a typically going to have a integrated circuit controller or maybe a small circuit board. But since these are made at such high volume, the drivers um, and the control and firmware are all very well integrated to keep the cost down. So. Uh, they're not as flexible as, say, a, a big machine uh, might be like the one I have in my garage, but um, it's still, nevertheless, it's got the same basic fundamentals as every other one. It's got some kind of a head object that does something, um, in this case, sprays ink, and it's got mechanical movement. In this case, it's moving the workpiece and the head. Some CNC machines move only the workpiece, uh, some move only the uh, head, and then some, most of them move a kind of a combination. Okay, and now going to my biggest CNC machine. This is my Avid CNC router. It has a four foot by four foot X and Y axis range, and the Z axis up and down is 12 inches. And this one actually has a rotary axis too. So I have four physical axes, um, three linear left and then forward and back and up and down, and then a rotational one here. So this one's um, a little more complicated. It's got, you can see, much larger motors. These are NEMA 34 motors. They're pretty powerful. Um, the work end or the head end of this, I have both a four horsepower spindle for router work and I have a 15 watt laser here from Op Lasers mounted to it so I can do both uh, cutting operations um, in, on, in flat work or 3D carving as well as rotary work and make things like spindles and other complicated objects using either one of these heads. So this system is, is a pretty, uh, it's much more expensive obviously, larger and more capable system and the other ones I showed, but it has the same basic motion and control uh, elements as well as the same process to generate content and then create commands and then actually run them on the machine. Uh, the spindle uh, type of head here is pretty versatile, so it spins, but you can also use it in a non-rotating fashion. So. Uh, for example, here in the spinning mode, when it's turning, these are all the, these are a bunch of different end mills and uh, you know the spiral and straight 
end mills as well as some V bits and things. So those would be those are the traditional router cutting heads. But I can also place something like this widget works uh, diamond tip. It's it's a spring loaded tip and it's used to press down and drag and make essentially make a scratch but you control that and it does some nice engraving you can engrave on granite and glass and metals with that so in that, in that mode you just put it in the router and it's not actually turning but it's uh, it's being dragged around the piece and then in a sort of similar fashion this is called a drag knife this mounts up in the chuck of the router as well and you and it's got a bearing in it, so it's a very, uh, very freely moving knife. And in this case, the head moves around, or the router moves around, and just this um, knife turns in the direction, kind of like the tail of a windmill, uh, in the direction it's moving, and cuts the material. So you can do precision cutting of like cloth or leather, uh, cardboard, paper, stuff like that. Um, so these are the you know different types of cutting. Um, or machining types heads you can do um, and in this case uh, then additionally have a completely separate laser head so very versatile you can put uh, plasma cutters torches um, all kinds of things on, on these you know um, very there, there's a lot of, of different things you can do on the same machine or customize um, in any way you need for your needs. Okay, here I'll just do a quick overview of the control system of my Avid machine, which is a little bit more on the more complicated side, but more capable side. So in this case, we have a completely separate control box here just for the um, spindle. So the spindle is essentially a three-phase uh, motor with uh, that's that you can program to run at any speed from uh, this one in this case I run from 500 rpm all the way up to 24,000 rpm so this variable frequency drive controls that speed and that is controllable by the, the program um, that that runs the rest of the machine and then this box is kind of the brains of, of all the operations so um, the Avid machines use a uh, Ethernet smooth stepper from Warp 9 and Tech Solutions um, that's this little board it's got a um, FPGA to do the precise control of motors, um, step, you know, their their speed and direction, and synchronizing other things like turning the spindle on and off, and and uh, laser operations and things like that. So um, it has that. Behind that are the high power stepper motor drivers. So those send the high current pulses out to run the motors. Um, these are the bulk supplies that run the whole system. So uh, it's a pretty much more elaborate system, much more capable system than the little laser system from Amazon that I showed earlier, which is just a simple Arduino board that has all the drivers and the software running on that and a little microcontroller. So it, it's always it's just get what you pay for. Um, those other systems are are not very. Uh, expensive but they do a specific job pretty well usually in this case this system is very expandable and it has very good precision control for synchronization of motor movements with things like lasers turning on and off or the power level so you get very smooth cutting results throughout the project regardless of motor speed and things like that okay I already showed a couple of my machines that I have at home um, this page kind of shows you the extremes of the range. Uh, on the left are some inexpensive hobby machines. Uh, the upper left is a, a small CNC router. I think it was a few hundred dollars uh, that I took the picture off of Amazon. And the lower left is a similar laser um, system uh, that was only a few hundred dollars as well. These are both Chinese. The uh, one next to it here is a Prusa 3D printer that runs around uh, $700 to $1,000 depending on whether you get the kit or uh, you buy the assembled version. But these are all on the low low end of size, capability, and cost in hobby machines uh, mainly. And the proliferation of these types of machines is what's really exploded in the last five years or so. And um, that's kind of the end that I'm uh, 
going to try to cover here as far as how their the controls look and stuff there's a lot of variation here especially in the hobby machines because of a lot of people are trying to build them as cheap as possible so they're looking for software solutions especially that are very low cost so a lot of those are shareware or freeware kinds of things um, but you can go all the way to the things uh, the two I have here on the extreme right um, and you can see the upper right is a uh, machine with probably a four or five axis rotary head that's the size of a human um, and he's standing on a rotary base plate so this thing is uh, a monster and then on the lower right um, the, the, you've got a CNC machine that's basically the size of a factory floor so you know you can go from a few hundred dollars on the left all the way up to tens of millions of dollars on the right so um, there's all kinds and sizes and capabilities out there so now I want to talk about at a high level the process, uh, you know, what is a, a CNC machine doing um, for you at a, a very high level? So the first thing you have to have is some sort of a tool. In this case, I've got a marker, uh, but it could be a laser head. It could be a router. It could be a knife. It could be a printer head or a 3D printer, you know, a monolithic filament injection uh, head. Uh, all of those things are for some, you know, going to do some useful thing, but they have to be moved around to make them do that thing. So first thing I need to do is have some content. Um, that could be a 3D model from a CAD program, um, you know, defined in, a, in, a, uh, in the program. You could rotate it and look at it in that program, but it's not, you can't make it into anything until it's converted later on to instructions. Um, or it could be a simple picture. But if you look at what you do when you draw something simple, the whole process is kind of there. So if I think I want to draw a square, for example, the content is a square and I can think of the square in my mind, what it's going to look like. And then I can take a tool like this and I can draw that content and, you know, my brain is controlling my arm to do that. So um, I gotta, I'm going to give it commands just like a CNC machine. So the, numerical control part of the CNC is the computer telling the machine to do specific things. It's just a bunch of commands. So the numerical control is just instructions, if you will. Move here, move there, turn this on, turn this off. So if you just think about drawing a square, um, a really simple G-code program might go like this. And a G-code program is kind of the one of the most popular uh, uh, languages, if you will, of these instructions, you know, and it doesn't matter. There's, there's different languages out there, but they're just instructions to do things and move around and stuff. Does it, you know, it's, it's like the difference between English and French. You can, you can say the same thing, they just have different syntax, different words, right? So if you think about um, this at a high level, the first thing I would, the, what I would do in instructor say, you know, arm the tool, so I take the cap off, then move to the board, that's a command, then, uh, drop, you know, move in the Z direction here, move in the Y direction, move in the Z direction, move in the Y direction, retract, disable the tool. That's about six or seven commands, specific commands to draw this square and the square I had in my head, right? So it's not a perfect square, obviously, because I'm not a machine or an artist, so I, I can't do it very good, but that's exactly what a CNC machine is doing is it, it took something that I designed in my head, just a square, and then I had specific commands to constitute all the motions needed and actions needed to create that square on the squeeze board. So we'll go through in more detail uh, how that's done on different machines, but that's really all the more complicated it is at a high level. All right, first, there's kind of two, two sections to explain. One is, how do we create the content that we actually want to run on the machine and turn it into a file that the machine can actually consume or use? And then the other one is, what is the software that actually runs the machine itself and what does the hardware look like? So first, let's talk about the content creation. Uh, first, you start with a, a CAD program, a computer-aided design. Um, this is simply, uh, think of it as like Microsoft Word, right? You, draw, you use that to write something or uh, and Microsoft Paint, you know, you can draw in that. Well, these programs um, 
allow you to create your design and it can take many many forms so you could have a 2d all the way up to 3d object which would be um, similar to your your, your really high-end CAD programs um, where you can create a full 3d model and rotate it and look at it and you know slice off pieces of it or it could be something very simple like just a PDF file um, that say a laser system might use because they're really a uh, 2d machine and they're just going to burn you know an image on a plane so there's a lot of um, there are a lot of different varieties here depending on how much money you spend and what capabilities you need and what kind of machine you're actually going to feed it into but the idea here is that it's it lets you create it it lets you look at it and modify it and then usually it's going to save it in in a some kind of proprietary format a lot of times or generally it's going to be a binary file not you know any kind of text content so you will need the tool again to view it um, in some cases there are standard CAD program formats especially on the higher end so like um, AutoCAD Fusion 360 Pro E there are several formats that those programs can share between them and, and so they're, tr they're transportable files from one program to another a lot of the lower end ones though are proprietary so you will need to use that tool um, to reopen the file and modify it. So the CAD file is just the content itself. Uh, it's not usable yet. It needs to be converted by a computer-aided machining program or a CAM program. Um, that turns it into actual instructions of how to make it. So, um, you know, before my example of you have a square when you make a CAD pro in the CAD program you might just draw a simple square the CAM program is going to take that and say okay well here's how you draw a square right it's multiple commands in a row um, but the CAM typically is going to output in a format that is still not machine specific um, it's usually a little bit generic because um, you might want to run that on multiple different types of machines so um, you know you take especially the more expensive programs like say fusion 360 those cost a lot of money autocad costs a lot of money pro money pro e they're very expensive programs so um, for somebody to really want to spend that kind of money they're going to want to be able to use that program with multiple cnc machine types so uh, the cam program is going to put it out in a generic format and then we're going to post process it in the third and final stage to create a specific file from the generic commands that will run on you know, the exact machine you want to use. So it kind of goes from high level object to generic commands to specific commands for your tool. And when it comes in the, in the post-processing part, that's also an area where the user can customize the post-processor so they can add certain things that fit into their process like Maybe they want to do automatic tool changes or they don't want to do automatic tool changes. So they can break up the job into different flows. They can add conveniences like turning on, say, um, a mister or a water jet to cool the, the bit. So lots of things um, that can be customized there outside of the actual uh, tool path itself. So uh, kind of a generic name for what comes out of the CAM program is a tool path and then it's post-processed for the specific machine. And I should also note there's, the, you know, there's the lines between some of these are blurred. M most of the high-end programs like Fusion 360, AutoCAD, Pro-E, Vectric V-Carve, and Aspire all have CAD and CAM built into the same program. So um, you, do, you basically do everything there. And then those are also going to have the you know support the post processors, and usually they come with many many post processors. And if you have you know a specific machine that they don't support, usually you can pick one um, and modify it yourself. And they also often document how the post processor should be written so that you can make it work for your tools. So, um, for example, Vectric has a post processor manual and tells you how to create one of your own so that's the first stage and coming out of post-processing you have a file you can load on your CNC machine and run 
And I thought I'd give a little bit more uh, clear example of that content flow. So again, as I said, in CAD, you're just going to create a square. In this case, uh, it's a my example here is it's just a one inch per side square with the lower left uh, origin being at two inches and three inches uh, on the tool. So it really isn't, that's a very simple object, but now we put that into CAM and we're going to make generic commands out of that. So I have to give it some more information here, um, like uh, how deep do I want to cut that? What end mill am I gonna use on the router? What speed should I run the router? And how fast should I run the router as far as X, Y speed and inches per minute? These are all things that you need uh, that don't really have anything, they're not relevant to the object itself, but they're very relevant to creating an object, you know, based on what kind of tools you're using, what kind of materials you're cutting it out of, things like that. So it takes the CAD design, you add some more information, you end up with this red list of commands here. So you uh, move the Z axis up. The first thing you do generally is make put the tool in a safe place. Then it's going to turn the router on, move the router to the starting position, uh, plunge the router down and then move X and Y around in a square and then when it's all done it's going to lift the router back out of the material and turn it off. So that's a very generic set of commands. Um, that's not an actual language yet that any CNC machine understands. So as they move to the right then in the post-processing this is the G, this is the actual G code format that would be in uh, on my Avid CNC machine, which uses uh, Mach 4 control software. So uh, G-Code is a very popular uh, machining, uh, machining code format. So these G1 commands you see, these are machining moves, and then the Z, X, and Y statements are just simply coordinates in the axes. So these uh, lines um, translate from move Z axis up to five to this G1 is a machine move up to Z equal five. And in the same fashion, this S command is the command used to turn, to set the spindle rotational speed to six, in this case, then 16,000 RPMs. And the M03 command is what turns it on. So you can see each one of these lines has a one to one correspondence between the generic command and the actual command that Mach 4 understands in this case. So uh, this is the actual file that Mach 4, you would load in Mach 4 and run and create that square. Okay, now let's go over the components of the machine itself. And again, I really wanna emphasize these blocks are fairly generic. They're gonna vary a lot from machine to machine, um, but generally they're fairly true for especially the hobby uh, size machines. Um, the first two here though can be um, completely separate software and hardware elements or they can be merged together in one hardware control and one software package. It just really depends on who designed it and how it was built. So first you have the controller software. Um, sometimes this is hardware and software but uh, you have to have an interface where you can, you know, control the machine, uh, calibrate it, um, make settings, move. In, in a lot of cases, you want to be able to manually jog the axes around and stuff. So uh, it's the ability to load files and, and make different settings and things like that. So this is the user interface. Um, it's also a lot of times got the low level motion control software in it um, and, and again sometimes this is is a separate package and sometimes not but so there's there's kind of two elements to the control one is that user interface with the high level uh, sometimes they have a whole GUI associated with them I'll show pictures later but um, some of these are very sophisticated and some of them are just very simple LCD screens with very few functions um, some examples are Mach 3 or Mach 4 uh, these are PC based uh, pretty sophisticated um, programs. Uh, another example is Laser Gerbil and Gerbil, where Laser Gerbil, Gerbil is a uh, kind of a shareware or, uh, 
GUI program that runs on a separate PC, and then Gerbil is the actual motion control firmware that runs on an Arduino. Uh, you'll see this uh, mostly on like the Chinese lasers and Chinese uh, CNC routers um, because these are kind of shareware and free. Whereas Mach 3 and 4 are um, you know industrial grade software programs, you have to pay for those, but they're much more capable as well. Then we have the controller hardware. So um, you have motors and things that have to be controlled with I.O. signals uh, in the machine. So motors, relays, you know, actuators, you have to provide power to routers and lasers and plasma heads and things like that. So there, there's generally going to be at least one circuit board or controller um, in the machine. Could be as simple as a very small Arduino board, could be uh, much more, much larger, could be many, many boards, but you're going to have some hardware. And sometimes, again, this hardware could run the high level software as well as um, the low level machine control. And, and the, move, the motor control, the machine control, uh, in some cases is very crude, some cases it's very sophisticated where you have uh, very tight timing between motor, say when your laser turns on and when your motor moves the head because uh, if you think about it, some tools don't care. Like a router, you could plunge in and sit there. It's not really critical that you immediately start moving. You know, it's okay if the motor sits there a little bit and then you move and then you retract. Whereas a laser, um, if you just let it sit there, it'll keep burning deeper and deeper and deeper into the material. So when you're doing etching, for example, you need to precisely turn on the laser when the motor starts to move and precisely turns it off turn off the laser exactly when the motor stops to get a really good product out when, when you're using it. So these um, some of these machines have, have very good timing control and, and typically there on the hardware you'll see things like uh, you know microcontrollers or even FPGAs doing that control to get very tight timing control. Then typically, uh, well I shouldn't say typically, this is kind of a, a, an optional thing depending on how big the motors are. So you, you need You'll have some motors, if they're very tiny ones, like on the small, small hobby machines, all you need maybe is a FET, uh, a field effect transistor, or some small circuit element to drive the motors directly. Um, generally, a microcontroller's output signals aren't strong enough to drive a motor, but they could be boosted a little bit just with a transistor. So small systems have the output drivers built right onto the control board, Whereas, as I'll show in a moment, some of the bigger ones with large motors like, like the NEMA 34s on my Avid machine require a pretty hefty um, motor driver, stepper motor driver. So they're, they're a completely separate module that's, that's much bigger. Um, then you have the motors themselves. That's kind of self-explanatory. Generally, you got two kinds out there for CNC machines. One is a stepper motor, which as its name implies, the motor doesn't just freely rotate, it moves in very discrete um, increments or steps as it turns. And so the computer says, you know, I want you to turn 32 degrees, which translates into, you know, maybe 5,212 steps or something like that. So it's a stepper motor. Then there's servo motors, which are more like a regular motor that they turn, but they have, since they don't have discrete steps, they have a feedback encoder that tells the controller how far it's turning because because in all cases no matter whether it's an open loop stepper motor or a closed loop servo motor they must move in precise distances that the controller wants so um, both of those have their advantages and disadvantages but in the in the end they they move the axes in specific uh, desired uh, distances or rotations uh, you know angles or whatever and then you have the head or the tool. Um, this is what, you know, this is the business end of the machine where work happens. Um, so, you know, there's tons. It could be as simple as a steel cutting lathe chisel that doesn't actually turn or do anything other than it gets moved around against a rotating piece of steel, for example. Or it could be much more complicated. You know, routers or mills, plasma cutters, um, just a plain acetylene torch can be mounted to a CNC machine knives, diamond chips, lasers, you know, there's many different um, 
types of heads that can go on these tools. Okay, and hopefully this maybe will help a little bit give you an idea of what some of these components look like or are, are size physically um, that I just talked about. So um, I got some pictures here from three different examples. One is a Prusa 3D printer that I mentioned. One is the laser system, the, the cheap Chinese one that I have um, that I showed previously. And then one is my Avid CNC machine. So under controller software, um, I actually added this pendant and a lot of especially like um, metal machining type things like CNC routers or mills and stuff you'll see this pendant uh, type control a lot of the commercial ones that you buy have these so this this LCD screen is the means to select things you know load files uh, you got a jogging dial here where you can actually move things around so a lot of machines might only have this pendant as the interface and then the example from the Prusa is this uh, orange one here where you just have this four line LCD screen and a little selector button here. Um, that's your whole interface um, to the machine. So it's, it's running some pretty simple firmware to select a file and, and run it. There's not much else you can do there. And then when, um, if you look at kind of going down the line, it's getting more sophisticated. Laser Gerbil, it runs on a laptop separate from the machine, and then the machine plugs into the laptop over USB. So you got a big window here that shows the actual uh, kind of a picture of what it's going to burn. So you get an idea of what it's going to look like, where it is on the table, how much progress it's made. And then it's got a whole bunch of controls for jogging the machine around and, and loading the file and starting it and stopping it and all that. And then Mach 4 on the Avid CNC is, is a, it's more similar to the Laser Gerbil, but it's just much more capable um, and customizable. So um, this also runs on a completely separate machine um, and then it can connect through Ethernet or uh, um, like USB or, or other means to uh, the controller. So then when we go down over to the controller column here, um, in the Prusa 3D printer, it's a little circuit board in this little square in the back of the machine, all custom, completely um, unique to this machine. If you look at the um, controller hardware on the small laser, it's a little, it's a custom, it's an Arduino board, but it's got some custom drivers and fan on it. So, um, it's, but it's basically a very small, about maybe two inches by three inches circuit board. This has got the firmware on it running Gerbil. So it's a combination of a hardware uh, board plus um, some industry standard free uh, firmware that, that runs on that. And then on the Avid machine, um, it's a little hard to see under all the ribbon cables, but it's a control board that's commercially available uh, called the Ethernet Smooth Zephyr from Warp 9 Tech Solutions. Um, they, they make this board specifically for motion control on CNC machines and Avid just happens to use that one and they also sell the board um, uh, by itself and, and you know ho many hobbyists use that and build their own machines from ground up with it as well. Then we look at the output drivers um, in the simple Prusa machine, the drivers for the motors and everything are also on that circuit board. Um, and in the laser gerbil or the, the uh, simple laser machine, they're also in here underneath the fan. They're just, as I mentioned before, some simple transistors uh, to drive the motors. And then you can't really see it under the Avid picture here, but I'm pointing to it. It's behind the control board. There's actually a large uh, plug-in DIN rail mount m uh, module for each one of the motors. So these are pretty big. Um, I believe they drive up to nine or 10 amps or something like that at 48 volts. So these can drive some very large motors. Um, and speaking of motors, on both the small laser and the Prusa machine, these are small. I think they're uh, NEMA 17s or maybe 11s. Uh, very small motors fit in the palm of your hand. Um, they don't take a lot of current to drive them. So um, that's why these control boards can be so small. On the Avid machine, these are a big, uh, I don't know, four or five pound motor. <clears throat> they sort of fit in the palm of your hand, but they're, they're very big and heavy. Um, and they take a, a lot of power to drive them. 
Uh, and on that machine, there's actually they're running in pairs to drive the Y axis and then one for Z. And so every axis of motion has at least one motion, mo motor on it. Uh, and then the head and tool, obviously, uh, the, the, the 3D printer is a, essentially a, you know, extruder. Uh, it's got a heater in it and it feeds out uh, molten plastic and that's how 3D printers work. It goes back and forth and um, lays that molten plastic out in specific patterns. Uh, in this cheap 3D, or this cheap laser, it's a very small uh, one or two watt laser head um, in the square. And then on my Avid machine, I actually have two tools on it. Uh, one is a big four horsepower spindle uh, on the upper left, and then on the right is a 15 watt off laser. So I can switch back and forth on this machine and um, do both of those um, cutting operations or etching or milling or whatever. Well, that's the end of the video and hopefully I covered uh, everything or, or most of the components um, to kind of give you a, a feel for all the parts. I know this doesn't, it's not enough information to help you pick the components or what kind of system you want, uh, but hopefully it gives you a little bit of background on the, uh, the pieces you need and some of the things you can think about so that you can go uh, forward and think about the specific things you want to do um, and maybe start looking at some of the components if you're trying to assemble one yourself. There's a lot of good videos out there um, on specific areas, but I was trying to um, just do an overview here. If there's any questions you have or if I omitted anything that you think is important, uh, please put comments down below and I will answer them. And if there are some good enough suggestions, I may even go back and make some modifications to the video and add those. Thank you very much.